Okay, good morning everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming along to the workshop. We really appreciate your attendance and, and you taking the time to, to come and uh, learn a bit more about travel and influenza. So today, sorry, I should introduce myself as well. So my name is Chris Barker. I'm part of the medical team at Sanofi Pasteur. Uh, and my role here as well is to kind of act as a, a bit of a facilitator for our two speakers. Um, so as was mentioned, we're going to make this a little bit of presentation and a little bit of interactive. So we really would appreciate your participation and your engagement today. A bit noise. Um, okay, so I think what's going to happen today, so we're going to start with our um, travel medicine workshop um, and basically we're going to do that till 10.15, till morning tea. Um, we'll break the morning tea but then if everything, if we're still interested in carrying on, we've got the interactive side of it, then we'll continue after morning tea and then after that we'll, we'll finish up with the influenza update which is more of a presentation based format. So in regards to what we're going to do with the travel medicine, um, we're going to have a introduction to travel medicine, so just a more formal presentation just to give you a bit of an introduction to everything. Uh, we're going to cover a practical approach to travel medicine and then some pre-travel prophylaxis, so pretty much focus on the vaccines. Uh, and then we're going to go into a case-based workshop, so we're going to have a number of cases. And the idea here is to get our two wonderful speakers to be in the audience with you guys. Um, and we're going to read out the case and then have them take opposing opinions um, to see whereabouts you guys sit and where you, what you think. So please, please, you know, um, participate and engage and speak up. And this is, we'd like to keep this quite informal uh, and make sure that it's, it's of use and interest to you. So just jump in and speak up. We'd, we'd really appreciate that. Um, okay, so I think... From that, I'll introduce our first speaker. So we're going to go straight into the talks. Um, we're very lucky today to have two very experienced uh, travel medicine um, nurses, both of which have got about over 30 years of experience between them. Um, not that they're old, they're very young still. <laughs> I just want to point that out before I get in trouble. Um, so both have postgraduate qualifications in travel medicine. They play a key role in the International Society of Travel Medicine Nurses professional group as well, and have extensive experience in travel medicine education as well. Uh, Danielle is one of our speakers on the right, on your right here, sorry. <laughs> um, so Danielle is a nurse practitioner who's also a co-owner of her own travel medicine clinic in Sydney and an academic at James Cook University too. And she'll be giving you an overview on the, the travel vaccine side. And then Carolyn, who's our, a registered nurse and has also worked as a, a travel health clinical nurse consultant and uh, has undertaken numerous deployments as well to places like Sierra Leone, where she's worked in uh, team leader for Ebola um, treatment centres. Uh, and she's currently the um, operational manager for Aspen Corporate Health 2 in Canberra. And she'll be giving us the first part of a talk. So, Carolyn, if you could um, head up this way, that'd be great. So, Carolyn is going to start by giving us a practical approach to travel medicine. Good morning. So, welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending the workshop. Um, so, like Chris said, I'm going to talk about a practical approach to travel medicine. So, just as a matter of interest, do most of the nurses here have travellers come to their clinics? Okay, that's great. Oh, sorry, oh, wrong way. Okay, so why is a pre-travel health consultation important? Well, we know that a large percentage of travellers don't actually seek specialised travel health advice and they have a very poor perception of risk. We know that the travellers that do seek travel health advice generally go to their GP um, to receive that. And of course, it's also very relevant because now more than ever, Australians are travelling um, on a really large scale. And in 2016, we had nearly 10 million short-term travel, travel departures, which is up from um, nearly 5 million in 2006. And of course, 500,000 permanent and long-term departures for Australian residents. So some learning objectives for today. Hopefully I'll help you develop a systematic approach to travel health consultations so that it becomes quite routine for you. To understand the importance of individual, individualised risk assessments. And that risk isn't just about the person themselves but also about the destination they're going to or what they might be doing when they get to that destination. I hope that you will develop confidence in recommendations that you might provide to your travellers and also to identify appropriate travel medicine resources and guidelines. So the key principles of pre-travel healthcare is to provide up-to-date information and advice. 
And it's not expecting people to know um, all this information in their head, but to actually know where you can go and find some good resources. And hopefully we'll help you with that today. It's really important to start early, so to encourage travellers to think about having a, a pre-travel consultation four to six weeks before they travel. And whilst you know you probably see a lot of travellers who at the end of their consultation with the doctor will happen to say, oh, by the way, I'm going to Bali next week, it's a good idea perhaps to, you know, you might have to perhaps do their travel consultation. Um, if they can't come back, you might have to squeeze some time in, um, in that instance, but it's a good idea to educate them that the next time they travel, to suggest that they come back for a specific travel appointment. And it's really important to provide, to um, allow sufficient time. So, you know, it can take perhaps 30 minutes for an individual travel health consultation, or if it's for a family, it might be anything up to about an hour. It's important to individualise advice and identify high risk travellers and we'll talk, I'll talk about some groups that are high risk travellers in a minute. And to encourage personal responsibility for safe behaviour, I think that's a really important factor and you know we can talk about anti-malarial medications to, um, to travellers. It's, it's important to actually um, put the responsibility onto them that they also need to think about things like um, preventative measures and things like that, but also other factors such as um, talking about safety. It's, it's to encourage people to abide by laws and, and rules in other countries. Um, consider the costs. So it's probably not appropriate to suggest a thousand dollars worth of vaccines to perhaps a backpacker. Um, so be mindful that you know people have limitations with what they can afford provide written information, and that's to support um, the verbal information that you're going to give them. And often in a travel consultation, people get overloaded with information, so it's a good idea to provide some supportive um, information for them to take home and read later and perhaps come back and when they're coming back for subsequent vaccination appointments that they have the opportunity to, um, to follow up with any questions that they might have, um, that might have been generated out of them reading that information. And to recommend a medical kit, and that can be in any, any form. It could be just um, some anti-nausea medication or some um, hydration salts. It can be various size. It can be as comprehensive as you like or depending on their destination and their, what they're going to be doing. It's also very important to consider health insurance, um, comprehensive travel health insurance, so not just to cover things like lost luggage. Um, you need to talk to your travellers about having death and disability um, and a med medical evacuation insurance. So there's four simple steps to a travel consultation and I think if you think of these, apply these four steps um, in all scenarios, you'll cover all bases. So the first one is to assess the person's health. The second one is to analyse their itinerary. The third one is to recommend vaccines and medications for prophylaxis and I'm not going to talk about that because Danielle will. And the fourth one is to provide education. So they're fairly simple steps that you will cover, you know, if you, if you uh, think of those every time you'll cover, cover everything. So assessing health, this is actually my mother um, going off or down in Antarctica and you know it's pretty important at 76 um, going and doing a fairly remote sort of voyage like that that you go and have a comprehensive travel health assessment. So what do we um, consider with a, you know when we're assessing a traveller's health? Well we look at their past medical history, so any pre-existing conditions, do they have asthma, are they a diabetic, what medications are they on, are any of those medications going to be controlled substances in the countries that they're travelling to? Do they have allergies? You know, if somebody's got a peanut allergy and they're travelling to Southeast Asia, that might be a bit of an issue. And I've just put um, websites there in brackets to remind me, um, and I know it's a resource, so I probably should be talking about it a little bit later, but there's some really great websites where you can log on and actually travellers can, um, for a small fee, put in their allergy, um, and they can get a, an information card um, that will provide information about that allergy in the language of the country that they're travelling to. 
So that's a really handy resource. Of course, age and sex should also come into the, the consideration. Special conditions, is somebody pregnant? What trimester are they in? You know, if they're in early pregnancy, have they considered the fact if they're going to a resource poor destination, what happens if they miscarry? Um, if they're in the third trimester, obviously there's going to be restrictions with airlines and um, cruise ships. Are they breastfeeding? Is there a disability? Uh, is the person immunocompromised? And I've, I've popped that picture in there. I did a river cruise last year with my husband and, and this elderly lady was on the cruise. She was a lovely lady and she um, had a terminal illness and she was quite um, um, immobilised and she'd gone on the river cruise assuming that she, somebody at the, on the cruise would be able to walk her around on all the day trips and the, the, the accommodation, the type of travel really didn't accommodate for her needs so I think it's really important that we consider those factors. Recent surgery is also very relevant, you know if somebody's had orthopaedic surgery are they cleared to fly, you know, got to consider the risk of a DVT. So there's lots of factors to take into consideration. Immunisation history, routine and travel vaccinations, again I'm not going to talk about that but you take that into consideration when you're assessing somebody's health and Danielle will talk more about that. Prior travel experience, so people, uh, travellers, you want to know about whether they've had anti-malarials before, have they had a good experience with them, have they suffered gastritis or nightmares or uh, photosensitivity, are there any factors, have they had any previous issues. The same with altitude sickness, just because somebody hasn't had altitude sickness on, on a trip doesn't mean that they won't um, suffer from it on a subsequent trip. And also have the, has the traveller undertaken any travel previously um, and been ill as a result. Analysing the itinerary is the second step of the travel consultation. Um, this is my family on a backpacking trip around India and of course, you know, um, that has very different risks to if we were to take our family to Disneyland on a holiday. So when you're analysing the itinerary, you want to look at the timing of travel, the countries and specific regions that uh, travellers are going to. Are they rural or urban? How long are they going for? Is it a short travel? Is it a business trip for three days or is it a backpacking um, trip for three months? What season is it? Is it the wet season or the dry season? And how long till they depart? You know, if, have you got the four to six weeks to make sure that they can complete um, their scheduled vaccines? Reason for travel? Are they travelling for tourism? Business? Are they expats? And I've seen expats um, who their children to go into international schools have all had to have ECGs to go into primary school. Um, so there's often um, considerations um, for those sorts of things. Visiting friends and relatives, does everybody, is everybody aware of that group of travellers? Yes, no? No? So visiting friends and relatives are travellers who are returning to their country of origin, so they might, be, might have been living in Australia for a period of time um, and they're returning home to their country of um, origin and this group of travellers often don't realise they're at, at significant risk of, um, of tropical diseases because they think they still have immunity. So I, I can remember seeing a man who had immigrated from Cameroon and he was going back and thought that he didn't need to take his anti-malarial medication like the doctor had prescribed him because he had immunity and consequently he came back um, to Australia and was very sick with um, falciparum malaria. So they're a very important group of travellers to consider. It might be that people are going to volunteer, um, do some aid work, research, or study, adventure travellers and that's more and more frequent. Pilgrimage and Danielle will probably perhaps mention that in her talk in regards to specific vaccinations. And healthcare, um, we have lots of people um, travelling to various countries for medical tourism and again, I hate to bring up just cases that I've seen, but um, we did see a young girl who was going to the Philippines for um, a medical procedure 
and she came to, her, her friend had told her she needed hepatitis A and typhoid and when we had a talk to her she wasn't vaccinated against hep B. So considering that she was going to have a surgical procedure, um, it was probably a very important factor to consider. Travel style, is it independent or a package tour? Um, my mum's currently on a, tra on a trip now where you know, there's a doctor, you know, a doctor the whole time that she's away. So there's luxury travel, but then there's backpacking, backpackers who uh, might be days away from any medical care. So those, those sorts of things need to be considered. Modes of transport, what, what types of accommodation are they staying in? Does the accommodation have, if they're in a malaria endemic region, do they have screening on the windows? So special activities, schoolies, um, really important group of travellers. Has anybody had schoolies come to them for any travel advice? No, they probably don't come and get it. Um, but they're a really important group to consider because these are young people who, it's often their first trip overseas. Um, there's often, you know, excessive alcohol and fun to be had. Um, a lot of the times there's drugs on offer, you know, there's, um, they're often targeted in some of the countries that they travel to. It's a bit the same with full moon parties. I'm not sure whether any of you had, had experience with full moon parties, but uh, that's a fairly um, popular activity for young people to do in Thailand. And um, there's all sorts of associated risks there. There's a lot of alcohol uh, and drugs. And, and that bottom picture is how they sell the alcohol at the full moon parties. They sell it in a bucket. So you buy a bottle of vodka and a can of Red Bull or something and, um, and away you go. The third step of the travel consultation is vaccines and medications for prophylaxis and self-treatment. And like I said, Danielle will talk about that. So I'll skip past that. The fourth step is to provide education so you're going to educate the traveller on the vaccinations that you're going to give. And like I said, I'm leaving that to Danielle. You're going to educate them on malaria, but you're going to determine is there actually a risk of malaria where they're going to. But we also need to consider other mosquito-borne diseases. So there's not just malaria to worry about. You've got to consider things like dengue fever, chikungunya, um, and Zika, of course. You will have heard about that um, over the past couple of years. So you're going to talk to them about anti-malarial medication if that's appropriate. You're going to talk about um, um, other, other factors such as protective um, wear, wearing long sleeves, um, long pants, using repellent, bed nets. Food and water precautions is a really um, important topic to discuss. So you're going to recommend strategies to minimise diarrhoea. Um, so don't do what we did on our first trip to Bali, walk straight into a, a restaurant that had a monkey on a chain and we thought, oh, this looks good, they sell American hamburgers and we all got sick. Um, you know, en encourage your travellers to eat where there's lots of people, um, busy restaurants, it's usually a good sign. Talk to them about gastro kits, there's some really good guidelines for treatment of travellers' diarrhoea. Think about appropriate prescribing of antibiotics. And uh, you know, I've seen doctors where they've written multiple prescriptions for antibiotics, but a lot of them aren't even relevant to the areas that they're traveling or the types of diarrhea. Altitude sickness. So to determine, determine if the itinerary puts the traveler at risk. And a lot of itineraries nowadays actually allow um, insufficient time for climatization. So Trips like um, trekking up Mount Kilimanjaro in five days is, you know, people drop off like flies on those sorts of trips. Um, it's really important to have people research their, their trips that they're doing. And of course, I think Danielle's going to talk about medications for altitude sickness, eh, Dan? No? Um, there are medications to, <laughs> to prevent and treat altitude sickness. We can talk about that later if anybody's got any questions. Environmental hazards um, is another factor to talk about. Avoiding contact with animals, so monkeys and dogs. And of course, children are at high risk because they're more inquisitive and they're more likely to want to go and pat a stray dog. 
but we also have to consider that they're often the ones who get bitten and they often get bitten in high risk areas. So if we think about rabies, um, which has a 100% mortality rate, children often get bitten on the, on the face or the head and that's um, a very, very important to encourage your travellers to avoid contact with animals. Respiratory illnesses such as avian influenza, Chris is talking about influenza after, heat and sun exposure, humidity, factors like that to consider, jet lag, fitness to fly, put DVT there. It's important, um, people, some people think it's a good idea to, if they're going on a long haul flight, to take sleeping tablets and bomb themselves out for the whole trip, but it's actually not, not such a smart idea because you're actually um, encourage, you know, you're not allowing yourself to move around, which is what you should be doing to avoid a DVT. Motion sickness, another thing to consider, and certainly my mum's trip down to Antarctica, that was a, a big factor. Personal safety, just bringing up the issue of insurance again, please talk to your travellers about ensuring they've got a comprehensive travel insurance. Traffic accidents, I'm not sure why when you go to Bali and Thailand and <coughs> Southeast Asia, People who don't ride motorbikes in Australia seem to think that they'll learn over there and consequently have lots of accidents. But it's also important to educate your travellers that they might, their travel insurance is not likely to cover it, so they need to be fully aware of what their policy um, does and doesn't cover. Water safety, you know, they don't always have lifeguards um, in the countries that we travel to. Substance abuse is... Um, can be fairly common and like I said, groups like schoolies and people going to full moon parties are often targeted. I've put robbery and scams there. Smart Traveller is a really fantastic um, resource to use. Um, there's lots of scams in places like Thailand where people go to places like Phuket and rent, rent jet skis. Um, and then they're, they're, when they go to return them, they're accused of damaging the, the jet ski and you know all of a sudden they've got a gang of people around them marching them to the ATM to withdraw a heap of money. So Smart Travel has some really good information on, um, on those sorts of factors. Provide education on safe sex, bloodborne pathogens. So talk about safe sex. Um, people who are travelling to, I, I put a tra a travellers going to endemic areas of HIV is a really important factor because I've seen lots of medical students and nursing students who've gone to Africa to work in hospitals but they've never actually considered what they'd do if they got a needle stick injury. So in a country where there's a high risk of HIV, <coughs> it's a pre pretty in important factor. Medical and dental procedures uh, also bear some risk, as do piercings and tattoos. So resources. So the CDC Yellow Book is a fabulous resource and that's um, free, full text online and the 2018 version is the one that um, you'll be able to find. The World Health Organisation is a very comprehensive website and it has fact sheets on uh, various, all, all, you know, all the countries in the world, um, fact sheets on various tropical diseases. It, it's a fabulous resource. The Australian Immunisation Handbook, you would all be very familiar with that and I would imagine that's probably your working bible. The International Society of Travel Medicine, has everybody heard of that? So the International Society of Travel Medicine, it's a great organisation and Danielle and I are both uh, members of that. They have a conference every second year in Europe or the Americas and every other year the Asia and Pacific Travel Health Conference is held in Asia or the Pacific. Um, it's about 105 US dollars, I think, the annual membership. Uh, when you join, you become part of a list serve. So various people from all around the world might put a, put a question to the list serve, and then you'll get lots of the experts um, providing answers. So it's a really good way to learn just, just by uh, seeing other people's questions and the answers from all the gurus in travel medicine. I've put Shoreland Travax there because that's a really good um, database to use. There's a subscription fee but they provide uh, really comprehensive traveller reports and they also have um, a great library and, and lots of other resources. Fit for Travel UK website um, is a terrific resource and Smart Traveller, 
like I said, it, it has um, alerts on various countries about safety, about um, you know the medical facilities in the country, about consular assistance, and it's also really important to register, encourage your travellers to register for travel. And I know I was in Thailand once when there was um, the demonstrations over there that were becoming quite um, large. And because I'd registered, I kept getting SMSs saying avoid this area. And um, so it was great being in a country where there was some trouble brewing. Um, but it also gives the government oversight of who's in that country. So um, if anything goes wrong, they have a good, uh, a good log of who's in country. Further travel medicine education, I've put the ISTM conference there. Uh, that's going to be in Washington next year. The Asia and Pacific Travel Health Conference was in Bangkok just about two months ago, last month, two months ago. Uh, that was a fantastic conference and that's going to be in Bali in 2020. The Australian College of Tropical Medicine have a really good two-day conference. I think that's in September this year. Monash University do a two-day travel health course. And then James Cook University do a postgraduate certificate in travel medicine which is um, a terrific course. It's about six months full time. And that's it, thank you. Hello everybody. So I'm going to be talking mainly about the vaccines because um, that tends to be the bulk of what happens in travel medicine consultations. Um, so we'll just jump right in. So to make it easy for us, um, I've divided the vaccines into what you should be giving routinely. All travellers should be offered these. What is recommended? So most travellers, you're not going to give every single traveller every vaccine that you have in your fridge. Um, and then the required ones. So people going to specific areas will require specific vaccines. So we'll start with the routine. So routine, um, we've got the DTPA. Um, another take on that is the DTPA IPV, um, which has the polio added. So tetanus is recommended for all travellers. It's a universal vaccine that's given in Australia to all our babies. Pertussis is even a risk here in Australia. Um, diphtheria, the risk for diphtheria, we have had a recent death in Queensland, unfortunately, from diphtheria. Um, but for travellers, Southeast Asia, New Guinea, um, the Soviet Union states, Baltic countries and Eastern European countries are still high risk for diphtheria. Um, tetanus can be fatal, it's an acute disease. Um, and polio is still endemic in Afghanistan, Nigeria and Pakistan. Um, so we've got the combination vaccines there. Um, now, I don't know whether you know the significance of, so the first DTPA with the capital T, that's the adult formulation. That's a lower antigen vaccine. Then you've got the capital DTPA, that's the childhood vaccination. They've got higher antigens. And then you've got the combined with the IPV. So before departure, adults should be given a booster dose of diphtheria tetanus that you can get for free in your doctor's bags, but it's not recommended for travel recommended for tetanus prone wounds only, so not appropriate for travel vaccinations or travel patients, I should say. Um, if more than 10 years have elapsed since the last dose, um, it's my preference, certainly in my clinic, I would vaccinate everybody with DTPA if they need to have it, um, if it's not been given previously. So for high, high risk trips, consider giving a dose, um, certainly if more than five years have elapsed and that more or less covers the whooping cough component. Um, measles, mumps, rubella, um, two different vaccines in Australia. We also have the MMR um, zoster, uh, varicella, sorry, um, vaccine. So risk to travellers or risk areas, Taiwan, Brazil, Italy, Albania, Portugal, Syria, Kosovo, Lib Liberia, <laughs> Belarus, Japan, Ireland, Philippines, France and Latvia. Um, we have outbreaks of measles at the moment in Sydney and also Brisbane. Um, when you have your patients in consult with you, particularly the male patients, check their date of birth if they were born in Australia. 
there was a cohort of boys that didn't ever get the second dose of measles, mumps, rubella. So you need to look for them, and they are born typically between 1984 and 19, sorry, 1981 and 1984. Um, if they most guys in that group don't know whether they had the second measles, mumps, rubella, just give it. <laughs> if you're giving um, live vaccines on the day, it won't be a problem. Just give it. Um, just to cover them and, and tell them that's your second dose, that's it, you don't need any more. And of course, if there's any risk of occupational exposure, you do a blood test to check the serology levels. Okay, so these vaccines are live, as I just said. So two doses of mumps containing vaccine are recommended for all non-immune adolescents and males. In Australia, all persons born during or since 1966 who are 18 months of age, or at least over 18 months of age, should have documented evidence of two doses of measles, mumps, rubella containing vaccine. So the minimum timing between the vaccines is four weeks because they're live vaccines. Um, and of course, as you probably already know, the MMRV vaccine is not recommended for use in persons over 14 years of age. That, recommended is for, that recommendation comes from NRMCH, NHMRC, sorry, and ATAGI. So hepatitis B, universal precaution vaccination. So our risk to travellers, um, the risk hepatitis B can be contracted through contaminated blood or blood products. So a lot of travellers unfortunately going to Southeast Asia are going there to get their cheap tattoos or their cheap piercings or their cosmetic procedures, all that kind of stuff. So they're actually high risk for hepatitis B. So um, as you read through, tattoos, sharing needles, medical procedures um, and uh, contaminated equipment can be a problem. Hepatitis B can be transmitted vertically during childbirth and horizontally to household contacts. So that's um, people within the same house using the same bathroom, sharing equipment like razors that they possibly shouldn't be sharing. Um, also sexual contacts, so vaginal and anal intercourse. Um, and as I said before, in Australia, it's uni universally recommended vaccine. The highest risk is in West Africa and also the Asian countries. So the vaccine is an injectable monovalent, as in Hep B by itself, or in combination, as in with combination of Hepatitis A. So the standard schedule, which I'm sure everybody knows, zero, one month and six months, there is a rapid schedule. Um, not both of the monovalent vaccines um, can be given in a rapid schedule, so do check the immunisation handbook about which particular one can. Um, non-responders, anybody had any um, experience with non-responders? So there's a lovely section in the handbook that tells you how to manage those people, and certainly I get them in my clinic, and we do get them over the line eventually. Um, pneumococcal disease I didn't touch too much on because um, it's a required vaccine for everybody. Um, so for that reason, it's on the immunisation program. It should be offered to all people at risk of invasive pneumococcal disease and look at the categories to see where your patients fit in. So we've got three different vaccines, the 7-valent, the 13-valent, the 23-valent. And just be aware that if you're giving the 13-valent with the flu vaccine, um, there is a risk of fever. So do tell the patient to have some paracetamol prior to having the vaccination and possibly let them know they'd need another dose um, at the appropriate time interval after having the vaccinations. And other routine ones, of course, chicken pox, um, shingles, free for over 70, so do target that group um, for that free vaccine. And of course, Chris will be talking about the annual, um, or the influenza vaccine um, next. So recommended vaccines. So risk to travellers for cholera, Certain people are going to be at risk. So certainly at the moment in, um, in Africa, in Tanzania, there's an outbreak of cholera um, on Zanzibar. So if you've got travellers going there, I would certainly recommend that they have the vaccine. Um, generally, the risk is low for travellers. Um, proper food and water precautions can minimise the risk of acquiring cholera. Generally, if, you're if your traveller is doing uh, a high-end tour, they're not going to be exposed to any kind of food or water that's going to lead to any um, outbreak of cholera. But if you've got somebody that's backpacking, doing it rough, or VFR travellers, yes, they may. So the vaccine's recommended for aid and refugee workers in endemic areas. So if you've got any volunteers or medical people going to do certain um, procedures, <laughs> um, definitely consider offering the vaccine to them. Um, and here we have the affected areas, Africa, Asia, and the Americas, of course. So the vaccine is oral. Anybody had it? It, it tastes quite refreshing, actually. I quite like it. Um, it's not unpleasant, I guess. 
Um, most importantly, you need to tell your patients to avoid food and drink for an hour before and an hour after. That includes chewing gum, that includes lozenges, <laughs> that includes medicine, that includes cookies. I can't tell you how many people have went, oh, I've just had a cookie, is that going to be okay? Anyway. Um, hepatitis A. So our risk for travellers, hepatitis A transmitted by ingestion of contaminated food and water. Almost everyone recovers from hepatitis A, almost. However, some people are at risk of death from fulmin hepatitis, so that's where the liver actually stops and, and it goes. Um, Sorry, the, risk, the high risk category is um, adults over 40 years of age and pregnant women. Um, there is a 2% death rate of hepatitis A in adults over 40 years of age. So if you drop that little bomb, people go, oh, I'll have that big. That's it. Yes, I want that vaccine. Um, so safe water supply, it's really important to have that discussion with your patients that are travelling um, and tell them, do you spend the money on the bottled water? It will really be worthwhile. Um, food safety. So. Eating off the streets, there's risk there. Um, you can never guarantee how the food has been actually kept before it got to the roadside, before it got lightly cooked, before you ate it. Um, improved sanitation and hepatitis A vaccination are the most effective ways to prevent the disease. So one dose of vaccine is really, really efficient, 98% protection, and the second dose then just gives you that lifelong kick. Um, you can do a serology for it, but you don't generally, the labs don't give you a reading for it. It's either detected or not detected. So areas of risk, South America, Central America, the USA, Middle East, European countries, Western and Pacific region. Um, and with our vaccines, we've got the injectable monovalent and we've got the combination vaccinations. The schedule being one initially and then one six months later. If you're giving a combination vaccine, you give the combination vaccine and then the hep A um, six months later. <coughs> Uh, Japanese encephalitis vaccine. So Japanese encephalitis is a flavivirus spread by mosquito bite. Um, it's a Culex mosquito that delivers the blow. Atagi says it's low risk, one case per million travellers. World Health, Health Organisation says the main cause of viral encephalitis with a case fatality rate as high as 30%. A little bit different of opinion there between the two. So permanent neurologic or psychiatric sequelae in 30 to 50%, which I would consider as quite high. So the vaccination is recommended. Um, travel to one month or more to endemic areas in Asia, Southeast Asia, PNG and the Western Pacific during the wet season or transmission season or visiting rural or agricultural areas or short repeated trips to risk areas. Advise patients to use insect repellent, close screens as in closed doors and just you know, make sure windows and doors are screened. Put the air conditioning on a comfortable level. You don't have to have it at 16 degrees, but it's not a favourable environment for mosquitoes. And sleep under nets. When you're instructing patients to go under nets, explain to them to clear the area before they lower the net down. Because if they trap a mozzie in there, they'll just they get bitten all night long. So in Australia, we're very lucky. We've got two vaccines. Way, way, way back when I started doing travel medicine, we had a very um, scary vaccination that had quite a lot of side effects, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, so we have a live attenuated uh, recombinant vaccine, uh, which is one dose, and you would give a booster at five years if appropriate. Um, and we also have uh, an inactivated vaccine, um, which is two doses. So the live vaccine can be given current currently, so at different sites, so one arm, one arm to other live vaccines given on the same day, um, or a, a gap of four weeks apart. Rabies. Now, I don't know if anybody is aware, but World Health Organization has just recently updated their stance on rabies, but I'm not going to cover that today. It's just too much to go into. So we're just talking about the vaccine. So um, dogs, 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 and monkeys, and bats, and cats, and raccoons, but it's dogs, 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 dogs mainly. 99% um, of all rabies uh, transmissions to humans. So World Health Organization says every year more than 15 million people worldwide receive a post-bite vaccination. At the conference in Bangkok, we heard a, a staggering um, revelation from one of the doctors in India. He said something like, was it 1,500 post-rabies bite vaccinations per day in India? I was like, thank God I was sitting down. I couldn't believe it. Rabies is almost always fatal, so you will read the, the odd case that somebody survived, but 100% fatality rate, really, um, with, with rabies. 
So, Atagi's advice to travellers, do not allow young children to feed, pat or play with animals. In my consultations, I actually go out of my way to say to the kids, if you touch the animal and the animal bites you, you have to tell your parents. You won't get into trouble because your parents need to know so that they can get you to the clinic for whatever the next step might be. So at the height, as Caroline was saying, of, of young children, bites to the head and face are, are quite common um, and that's a high risk area. Um, my advice to all um, people is avoid monkeys and dogs. Um, don't carry food on you and don't feed them and pat the monkeys. So all these people going to the monkey jungle in Bali, don't do it. So rabies, we're very lucky we've got two inactivated vaccines in Australia um, and the appropriate schedule is um, three vaccinations, 21 day course, so day zero, day seven, day 21. If your patients choose not to have the vaccination, do talk to them about the immunoglobulin do tell them it's um, mixed up depending on their weight um, so that they know to expect they're going to get quite a lot of little injections into any bite sites that they might get. Just good for them to know. And I guess if you're trying to um, you know, discuss risk benefit, is it a good idea to have the vaccination? Maybe you might encourage them to have the vaccination by saying, oh yes, you know, you're going to have two mils of immunoglobulin injected into your pinky. You won't have that much, but just to give them an idea and the cost, it's very, very expensive. Um, so rabies post exposure. So if they've had the pre-exposure vaccination, you don't need to give immunoglobulin. You give a vaccine day zero and a vaccine day three. If they have not had any rabies vaccine before they go, in some cases, immunoglobulin is required. Um, if you go to the World Health Organization documentation, or even if you go into the immunization handbook, you'll see the different categories that um, exposures are given. Um, so an immunocompetent person, according, and this is according to the immunization handbook, this is not the new World Health Organization stuff that's just come out. So immunocompetent person would have a vaccine, they'd have immunoglobulin, depending on the category, and they'd have a vaccine day zero, day three, day seven, day 14. Immunocompromised uh, person would have the extra vaccination on day 28. So typhoid, any typhoid Marys here? <laughs> um, typhoid's a bacterial infection. Um, it's in the bloodstream and in the intestinal tract. It's shed in the stools. So really, really important to tell your patients to wash their hands when they're traveling and also carry hand sanitizer. So contraction is also via consumption of food and beverages that have been handled by a person who's shedding the bacteria, hence my typhoid Mary joke. Typhoid's common in most parts of the world, such, such as South uh, East and Southeast Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, Central and South America. VFR travellers are at the highest risk because they generally don't stay in hotels. They go back to the family home and go and get a drink of water from the tap and cut something on the board. Yeah, so high risk for those people. Um, vaccines are 50 to 80% effective. We've got the injectable monovalent and we've also got in combination with hepatitis A, as I talked about before. You've also got the live attenuated oral vaccine, which is fantastic. Um, if you read the immunisation handbook, you can give a fourth dose of the oral vaccine, um, but it does come in a three dose packet. So the live vaccine may be destroyed by gastric acid. So that's another vaccine that you need to explain to your patients fast now before, fast now afterwards, no cookies, no, no nothing, just nothing. So required vaccines, these are the ones that you're going to give for specific destinations. So meningococcal disease, our patients traveling to the Hajj and Umrah, so the ACWY vaccination. So meningococcal spread by air droplets. If you're traveling to or residing in parts of the world where endemics are, so ACWY exists, you should be getting that vaccine. It's the highest risk in the 26 countries in and around the sub-Saharan um, African belt, the meningococcal belt or meningitis belt. So persons traveling to mass gatherings and participants at the Hajj, they have to give documentation of having had the vaccination. There's no official card that you give, you just write it in their um, vaccination record book with the vaccine um, peely, let's stick it in. Um, there's three conjugated vaccines available in Australia. Yellow fever. So risk for travellers, it's an acute viral hemorrhagic disease transmitted by mosquitoes. Is anybody in an, an accredited yellow fever clinic? For those that aren't, if you're considering doing it, you just need to contact your public health unit and they will talk you through the steps. There's a bit of criteria that you need to meet to be able to give the vaccine and stock the vaccine. 
Um, so the virus is endemic in tropical areas of Africa, Central America and South America. Central America, it's only um, certain parts of um, Panama at the moment. Um, a small proportion of patients who contract the virus develop severe symptoms and die of multiple organ failure or encephalitis within seven to 10 days. So it's pretty quick onset, usually within six days. So the vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. It can only be ordered by accredited vaccination centres through the distributor. It's not available at the pharmacy. I can't tell you how many patients I've had come to see me for the yellow fever vaccine with a script from their GP going, oh, I couldn't find it anywhere. Oh, okay. Um, Precautions to vaccination, so um, patients, so this, these recommendations came in 2009, so patients over 65, people who are HIV positive. Now, I did put here, do a, a CD4 count, that is in the immunisation handbook, but it means nothing if you don't know how to interpret the results, so take it with a grain of salt, I guess. Um, more or less the contraindications, so in Australia, we don't give the vaccine to infants under nine months of age. We certainly don't give it to immunocompromised people or people with thymus disorders. And that comes to the end of my vaccines. <laughs> so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have afterwards. Just grab me. OK, so what we might move on to now is influenza. If I can find the link. And unfortunately, you've got me for the next 45 minutes, giving a bit more of a formal presentation. Uh, please feel free to jump in and ask questions if you'd like. Um, I will try and go through this um, relatively quickly because I've got quite a few slides here. Uh, but what we'll do is, yeah, well, I'll just um, get on with it. So today, what I thought I'd give you a talk about is basically a bit of it. So what I'm going to try and cover today is a bit of influenza background. So a bit of background about the actual um, virus itself. A reminder of why we need seasonal vaccines and give you some actual, actual rationale behind why we, why we recommend this. Uh, have a quick look at what happened last year. Last year was, as I'm sure most of you um, remember, a pretty horrific season. So I'll give you some details on why that was the case. Um, we're going to look at some of the current influenza vaccination options and we'll give you some of the, the backgrounds of, of vaccines and how they're made and where they come from and why we, where the strains are se uh, selected from. And then I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the new vaccine. So again, I'm pretty sure most of you are aware there have been some significant changes in regards to the over 65s. So we're going to start with some influenza background. Um, so I'm going to warn you as well, and please don't hold this against me. I come from a science background, so I might get a little bit sciencey. Please bear with me. There is some method to my madness, so hopefully it will make sense to you. So we know influenza virus is an RNA virus, and it is basically subtyped or typed into type A, B, and C. A and B, we obviously know that that's the, the key ones that infect humans. Um, type A in particular is responsible for most of the pandemics and epidemics that we see. Type B, look slightly less severe and, and doesn't um, produce epidemics as regularly as type A, but still quite a significant disease in, uh, in humans. Um, and type C is uh, very rare in humans and very, very uh, low level of, or severity of disease. Um, and when we look at the subtypes, so hopefully these names will make some sense to you too. So we've got H1N1, H3N2 for the, um, for the type A, and type B, the Yamagata and Victoria strains as well. So when we talk about influenza viruses as well, it's important to remember that these are not naturally, or they weren't naturally um, human viruses. The natural reservoir for these viruses is generally aquatic birds and um, ducks. So they can infect a, a whole different range of uh, mammals, or sorry, uh, birds and other mammals as well. Uh, interestingly, in ducks, I think it's, it's actually not a respiratory infection. It's shed through the feces, which is quite interesting. Anyway, so here's the warning. As I warned you, I, I do like a bit of science, so I'm going to throw a bit of science in there. Um, hopefully it will make sense. So what we have is it, the influenza virus, if we look at it, and this is essentially what I've tried to give you up here, is, is this is like a section through the virus. There's a few couple of few things that I'll point out which are important. So the first thing is that this is um, influenza is an, uh, an RNA virus. And, and that's important because RNA has a high rate of mutation. And this allows the virus to introduce mutations into its genome to allow it to evolve and adapt over time. And so this is really important. We'll talk a bit more about this in a minute. Um, on the outside of the virus, we have three major outer membrane proteins. So we have hemagglutinin, uraminidase, and um, the M2 ion channel. Don't worry too much about that one. But from a, a, a vaccine perspective, hemagglutinin is kind of what we standardize all our vaccines against. So we measure the content of the hemagglutinin, and that is the standard for, for uh, vaccines. So our standard vaccine is, is 15 micrograms of hemagglutinin. 
Hemoglobin is actually really important to the virus because what it does is it, it attaches the virus to the cell. So it binds to something called sialic acid on most cells and that allows the virus to, to bind and enter the cells. So really important. Neuraminidase does the opposite, it actually helps release the virus from the cells. Um, and hemagglutinin is also a dominant out of membrane protein. So it's the dominant protein on the virus and it's about a ratio of about four to one uh, in regards to neuraminidase. We also have a whole heap of um, non-structural proteins, but these are really important in the replication of the virus too. The other thing I should probably point out here as well is that the, is what we call a segmented genome as well. So what we have here, again, in, this, in the virus, each one of these strands is a, is a unique gene, um, and those genes are segmented. So that means that each, p, each gene has its own piece of RNA, and that's important, and we'll talk about that in a second. So as I mentioned, which I think I've already gone through this, is that the hemagglutinins are responsible for the, the influenza virus binding to the cell and entering the cell, uh, and neuraminidase is responsible for the viral release. So it's just an overview. And what happens is the ba basically the virus attaches to the host cell, it gets uptaken, unpackages its genome, uh, it allows replication, so it hijacks the host machinery, and then uh, ex uh, ex uh, releases or buds the virus out of the host cell. Okay, so I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but influenza is highly transmissible. I'm sure all of you know this. Uh, the incubation period about one to four days, and when we see symptoms, it's normally about two to seven days. Obviously, it can be different in different patients, and you're contagious for up to around nine days. Um, in regards to transmission, air is, is definitely a, a problem. So I've read some papers recently that suggest that influenza can actually sit. When we sneeze, there's a different size of droplets that are formed. And influenza can sit in those very fine droplets, and that basically means it can sit in the air for up to about three hours. Um, so, so it can hang around for a while. Uh, obviously, transmission via touch. These viruses are quite good at, at surviving outside of the cell and outside of the body for um, you know 24 or 48 hours. Uh, and yeah, environmental exposure too. So when we talk about disease or morbidity, then. Um, we, you know, I feel generally it's, influenza always get lumped in with uh, the common cold. These are two very, very different diseases, especially when it comes to um, the morbidity and, and the symptoms. We know the classic, um, again, I'm not going to teach you guys this, this is preaching to the choir again, but the, the classic symptoms here, um, so uh, respiratory, fever, headache, that kind of thing, coughs. Um, there are a bunch of high risks associated, so high risk cohorts or groups associated with disease as well. So children, highest risk of hospitalisation for influenza diseases in the children. Um, older adults as well, this is where we see a high, a high, um, high amount of mortality as well, so uh, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Pregnant women, again, very high risk for complications of disease. Uh, and when we look at exacerbations, so what influenza can actually trigger, some of the major things, so cardiovascular disease and pneumonia, obviously some of the two key complications that are associated with this infection. And ultimately, what we see is that influenza increases hospitalizations. Um, we see significant morbidity and mortality as well. Uh, it's also important, I think, at this point to point out that, you know, sometimes I think when we look at the burden of influenza and, and the actual impact it has from a, a, a disease perspective, we sometimes we don't get the full picture. Like if a patient dies of a heart attack and had influenza two weeks earlier, it's pretty much known now that that those two events are probably linked. We, we're inducing a very you know influenza induces a, a strong inflammatory response in the host, which is going to drive that, that heart attack. So there's it's a significant disease. I think my point is here, um, and it, it has significant complications as well. Okay, so let's go over why we need a seasonal vaccine. So this is a bit of, this is hopefully where the, the boring science bit at the beginning will make a bit more sense now. So we've talked about the, the ability of the virus to, to, um, to have this high rate of mutation. So the virus, because viruses obviously can't sexually reproduce, so they can't create genetic diversity. So the way they do this is through that mutation. Uh, and they have a, a, a process called antigenic drift. And antigenic drift essentially is these minor changes that occur within the virus. So that RNA, that the, the genome mutates, has small mutations creep in, allows changes to the outer side or the, out, the surface of the, the um, virus to allow it to escape the immunity and create continual epidemic. So essentially it's, it's, um, it's escaping, it's a continual battle between uh, host immunity and the, the virus, the virus to escape that and to continue to propagate. So what this means is that basically every year we're normally seeing different viruses circulating to what we saw the year before. So every season is essentially unique um, and that means we need an annual vaccine 
which is updated and, and matched against the circulating strains. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail, but I'll, I'll go through that too. So the other thing this virus can do, and this is, um, this is something a little bit more significant as well in regards to disease, is that it can, it can induce a major change. So what, what this means, so antigenic shift is, uh, is where the virus essentially changes its genes around. So what happens normally is you have a virus, or two viruses infect the same cell, um, what they do is they exchange genetic material because those genes are, what the, remember the segmented genome that I talked about, so each gene has its own little piece of RNA. What they can do is change, exchange the different segments, so then you produce a virus which is essentially brand new and you've got no immunity in the population so these things can run absolutely rampant and these, this is pretty much what happens in a pandemic. So for example in 2009 was the last pandemic we saw, so that was swine flu and that um, came from what's called a triple reassortment. And, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So just to kind of visually give you an idea of what's happening. So I'm going back to antigenic drift. So these are the small mutations that can occur. So what we have is this, this RNA genome in introducing small mutations. And if you look at the outside proteins here, they're making slight changes. Now these slight changes may not appear to be that significant. However, from an immune perspective, it's very significant. What that's allowing the virus to do is to escape the, the natural host immunity that's already there. So it allows the virus to propagate. Um, oh, I've covered that. Um, okay, so antigenic drift, again, I think I've been through this, but again, just to highlight down here, what we have is a, a visual kind of, if you see the antibodies binding the virus, as the changes are introduced, you can see less and less antibodies bind um, and it allows the virus to become uh, more infective and transmit and continue to propagate. So antigenic shift, so this is where we cause the pandemics. This is what normally happens is we see uh, a, a different species of so a virus that's in uh, come from a reservoir, a different reservoir. Uh, so remember that humans aren't normally the natural reservoir, so birds, aquatic birds, and also um, pigs can generally kind of that intermediate species. Um, and what happens is we take a virus that's come from that it's actually recombined with a human virus so it has the ability to replicate in the humans uh, and then what we see is we see major changes so these these out of membrane proteins in the, the resulting virus are, are completely new to the human population so we have no pre-existing immunity so this is where the pandemics come come in i think in 2009 it was actually a triple resort uh, uh, so it used aquatic birds so as an avian a pig and a human species all recombining to produce a brand new virus and when that happens, it also has a major impact on our vaccines. Obviously, our vaccines are based around the seasonal vaccine, the seasonal strains that we circulate. So we haven't; they're, they're no longer capable of protecting us against a, a pandemic. So pandemics can be pretty significant, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, as I said, there's probably little or no population immunity there, um, and normally we see major changes in the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. Um, and and uh, what happens because there's no immunity, we see this rapid spread throughout the globe. And it's actually the 100 year anniversary at the moment of the Spanish flu, which was in 1918. And just to give you an idea of how severe this, this disease can be, there was about, it's estimated between, depending on what papers you read, 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide caused by Spanish influenza. So this is a significant um, infection. So hopefully I've convinced you that you know, seasonal vaccines are important. Oh, I should have mentioned this bit as well. So. Um, there's an interesting study or a, a research project going on at, at the moment in New Zealand called the Shivers Project. Um, I love that acronym. It stands for Southern Hemisphere Influenza Vaccine Effectiveness Research. And, um, and they're doing some great things over there. They've got funding from the CDC. But what they did one season is, they, I think it was in 2015, uh, they took a million people and they followed them through this flu season. They swabbed them and checked them. And they found that 30% were actually positive for, um, or just over 30% were positive for influenza. And what they found, which is really interesting, out of that 300,000, only 25% were symptomatic. So there's 75% that are asymptomatic, which is allowing transmission of the virus in the human population. Um, again, is another reason really to why we need a seasonal vaccine. We need to cut that transmission. Uh, so it's, it's another important thing to keep in mind. So you may not be, you know, you may come across people that are not symptomatic, but they may well be infected with influenza. So the key thing though with I think seasonal vaccines, which I hope I've got across, is the antigenic drift. So it's driving the, the virus's evolution and creating a production of a continual production of new viruses. Um, waning immunity is also a concern. So I think this might tie in with a bit of antigenic drift as well. Uh, we think at the moment, and the, the advice from Atagi at the moment, is that the peak of the immune response is around three to four months. And it's recommended that, that you try and align that with the peak of the, the season 
from about June to September. Uh, and I think we covered that one, yeah, so the high level of asymptomatic infection. So hopefully I'll convince you that the seasonal vaccine, but more importantly, why we need that seasonal vaccine. So there's some sound logic behind why we did do that. So let's have a look. So we'll look back now at 2017 and, and look at why it was so bad. If we look at the number of notifications, so this red peak here was 2017. Now just to give you some perspective, I think it's the, yeah, the blue peak here was 2009. So that was our pandemic year. Uh, and this was this was last year. So you can see it's straight away as well. It's, it's about two and a half times higher than we saw in 2016. So a huge number of notifications compared to the previous year, and about three and a half times higher than the actual five-year average. So there's a staggering number of uh, cases actually identified and confirmed. So this is laboratory confirmed influenza. When we look at states, what we see is that when we look at the instance rate. So when we talk about instance rate, this is the number of cases per hundred thousand of the population. See, SA was actually the highest with about 14, uh, well, 15, almost 1,500 per cases per 100,000, which is huge. Uh, and then New South Wales, Queensland, ACT, all up there quite too, as, as quite high. You do see a bit of a drop off. Interestingly, and this is really weird, is, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, is that you see WA is a very low number here. And what's quite interesting about here is, is that we, when we look at the west coast of Australia, they had last season, they actually had quite a quiet season, a mild season. The east coast got absolutely smashed and central um, Australia. And then New Zealand as well, last year was very quiet too. So they had a very quiet season. And the n amount of travel between Australia and New Zealand, I think there's a, a million people or over a million people each year that travel between the two. So it's, it's quite fascinating that it's sort of just in these areas. And we don't know why, it's very difficult to explain this. So when we look at actual burden, so the actual number of notifications per state, New South Wales had the majority, which isn't surprising, so the higher, uh, higher population. Um, Queensland was second, and then Vic, uh, SA was also up there. But again, if you look at WA, we're looking at 2%, so it's a lot lower. Um, and, and obviously, TAS and ACT and NT, a lot lower population, so you'd expect to see a lot fewer um, notifications there. So one of the other things that we noticed last year, and this is a continuing trend over the last couple of years actually, is outbreaks in nursing homes. And this is a, a big concern too, because this is where we see a lot of our mortality too in this population. Um, so we've seen over the last couple of years, basically, well, since last year, it doubled over from 2016 to 2017. Um, and we're definitely seeing an increasing trend. So the over 65s account for about 22% of all lab confirmed notifications, and I think they're around 15% of the population, don't quote me on that. Um, so we see a, a high burden of disease in that, that cohort and that population. And there was about, so overall last year, there was about a quarter of a million cases, lab confirmed notifications reported. Um, um, so we saw about 50, just over 50,000 of those in the over 65s. But when we look at the mortality, so 90% uh, of influenza-related death is, is occurring in the over 65. So as I said, in the kids, it's the risk of hospitalisation. In the ad older adults, it's um, the risk of influenza-related deaths. So it's about 990 deaths that are associated last year in the over 65s with influenza. It's a significant problem. So why, why did we see this? What was, um, as I said, pretty much every season is unique. So when we look at this, um, what we found was when you actually look at the data, that there were multiple strains co-circulating, which affect all age groups. So this definitely had an impact. Uh, the most severe strains, so that you'll hear about H3N2 being talked about a lot, um, and this is associated with quite severe outcomes. Um, the reason why, especially in the over over, over 65s, it's uh, it's a lot more severe in that population. Um, we also saw a decrease in the vaccine effectiveness, particularly for H3N2, which is kind of why we saw that high level of mortality in the over 65s too. Uh, there was low vaccine uptake, the, you know, the generally the flu vaccine isn't very well, um, the coverage wise is, is not great, but it was particularly bad last year. Uh, um, but we also saw better testing and reporting, and this is something to keep in mind too. So the more we look for something, generally the more we find it. When you go out and start looking for infectious diseases, you can, you can generally find them, So um, as New Zealand has been showing. So when we look at the strain breakdown, this is showing strains from, or the, the makeup of the circulating strains across the last five years. And we can see in 2017, it was quite interesting because there was a predominance of the H3N2, which is in the blue there. But the other two strains, so B and H1N1 were also there, and they were kind of almost at a 50-50 ratio as well. Um, so you, that, that's um, quite unusual if you look across the, the previous seasons, it's normally one or two that really dominate. 
When we talk about vaccine effectiveness, so this data was published back in September. This was um, the, the, so what happens here every year? The, there's GP networks set up, and they'll try and monitor. So they'll take swabs uh, and they'll look at how effective the vaccine has been. It can be quite difficult because they can't get that many number-wise. It's very difficult to get high numbers to really evaluate this kind of data. So, um, but this was this was a sort of a pre, obviously not by the end of the season. Um, but what they found, which was interesting, is that all strains, they saw about 33% effectiveness. But when you start breaking it down by age groups and strains, we see some, some differences there. So um, for H1N1 and B, we actually see quite uh, OK for influenza vaccines um, effectiveness data. So 50% for H1N1, about 57 for B, which is good. But this is where we see the problem is back in the, the H3N2 strain. So what we saw in the general population, so that looks like 10%, but these confident in intervals, which are the little bars above the, the diamond, and below the diamond cross that zero line. So whether that's actually 10% or not is very debatable. Um, and then when we look at the over 65s in particular, we see pretty much zero effectiveness of our vaccines. Uh, and so that's obviously a, a major problem. So um, this is another reason why we, we have a problem, and I'm sure you're probably all aware of this, with the over 65s, it's very difficult to generate immune responses uh, from a vaccine perspective, but immunosenescence is, is definitely something which um, impedes the ability of the immune system to respond. And, and basically what it is, it's, it's just as we grow older, we have a reduced ability to mount an immune response to new exposures, to new antigens. So when we put a new vaccine into a, an older adult, then their immune system is less efficient at processing it and presenting it and, and driving a new immune response. And it kind of makes sense if you think over time, you know, the amount of things our immune system's seen. We've got this huge pool of memory cells built up, so our ability or our need to, to generate new immune responses is probably not as important. But we see so immunosenescence, and that it's kind of based on a couple of different key things here. So basically, as I said, the memory populations here. So what we see, and particularly with the over 65s, is their memory pool is, is really big, but their naive pool, and by naive I just mean the, the new immune cells that are there which are able to respond to new things. Um, they haven't been sort of pre-programmed. Uh, they've actually reduced and shrunk, so we see a bit of a decrease in their diversity as well. Um, we also see um, that the, the antigen presentation, as I said, so this is a really key bit as well. So when you give a vaccine in an arm, what happens is that antigen is normally uptaken by immune cells and then presented to the adaptive immune system to generate those memory responses that you need. So that ability to do that is actually becomes a little less efficient as we get older too, particularly as we go sort of over that 75 to 85 area, it really starts to drop off there too. And there's also something I love this term, inflammation, which is um, another concern issue. And what they found is essentially it's uh, in the over 65s, we see it, they're kind of a, a, a sterile Im uh, inflammation, a low grade sterile inflammation essentially. So we see an increase in inflammatory markers. And the problem comes that when we, again, if you think from a vaccine perspective, if you put a vaccine in an arm, you need to generate a local inflammatory response to drive the immune system, to drive um, uh, protection. So. If you've already got quite a high baseline uh, inflammatory, low level inflammatory kind of response throughout the system, then to try and induce that, you need to, to in, in, you basically get over that baseline. It's a lot more difficult to generate those new responses. So this is another issue with, um, with the over 65, so why may the, the vaccines may not be working as effectively. Uh, the other thing that's been spoken about a lot, and particularly in the media, is egg adaptation. So influenza viruses are produced in eggs. It normally takes about one egg per vaccine. So you can imagine globally, that's a lot of chickens and a lot of eggs. Um, but what, what happens is essentially the, uh, the, the circulating strains, whatever's decided to be in the vaccine, which we'll talk about a bit later, uh, is basically recombined with a human vi uh, an egg adaptive virus to produce a, a virus which has all the human genes in it. So this is the one down here. And then this virus is actually propagated through the eggs. And what happens is that when we, we put the, so firstly you've got to remember that, you know, the avian viruses, the, the, the viruses that, that in the bird population, they bind to different receptors in the human viruses. So we need to be able to tweak the viruses to make sure we can grow them in eggs essentially. And what happens in this propagation process, uh, and pretty much all flu vaccines are made in eggs. Um, there is definitely a push to move away from this technology. It's very old and archaic. Uh, but the, one of the issues they've had recently is that with the hemagglutinin, they've started to notice that it can be minor changes, so not even not mutational changes, but minor changes to what's called a glycosylation of the protein. And that essentially is, is slight changes to the structure of the protein, which means the immune system no longer recognises it as well as it should do. 
So we end up with a, a virus or a vaccine that doesn't elicit the immune response we need. So the circulating viruses and the, the vaccine viruses don't quite match up. So we think this is another issue too. But again, this is an area of, of active research. So a lot of influenza research is sort of, well, we don't really know is the answer. And unfortunately, that's the case with a lot of things. That, um, low vaccine uptake. So this is another reason we talked about in regards to why last season was so bad. Um, so we know that about uh, out of the uh, Australians that were eligible for vaccine under the National Immunisation Program, there's about 70% uptake, which is is quite good. That's, in fact, it's very good for influenza. Um, however, there's still that means there's still about two and a half million people at risk of complications. Um, the average, that the, regardless of NIP eligibility, was about 30%. So you can see that coverage is pretty poor when we consider it, yeah, compare it to other vaccines. Uh, and when we look at children as well, children are a big, so there's some nice data coming out in the UK at the moment that's showing that there is some potential for herd immunity, whether it's you know, a lot more research needs to be done to prove this, but immunising children is definitely um, an effective strategy for trying to prevent disease, especially in the older adults as well, because we're cutting that transmission chain, um, hence a herd immunity bit. So it's, it's, uh, we, we know though for Australia that the nationwide average is really, really low for kids too, so it's about 3%. So the other thing I mentioned was that if we go looking for things, we find it. So flu, people like to talk about tips of icebergs. We um, think about the hippo emerging from the water here. Uh, but we, we're finally starting to see some of the true burden of disease out there because we're now looking for it a bit more actively. Um, but the flip side of that is the more we look, the more we find. So it appears as though there's a lot more influenza there. Um, so it's very hard to actually gauge with what we're seeing is, is a massive increase or is it just, uh, you know, it's always the same, that's what it is normally. So mostly in the past has been quite low rates of testing. Um, and we also know, again, coming back to this point that flu, flu triggers complications. And this is obviously lost in that data collection as well. It's not being caught, you know, the person that has a heart attack two weeks after they've been infected with influenza uh, doesn't really um, get caught as an influenza related complication. So that's, I think we're still missing a large burden of, of what's happening with influenza. And obviously we know there's a high level of asymptomatic infections too. Um, I think I'll cover that, so I'll skip through that. So the lessons we've learned from 2017. So basically we know there's been multiple strains circulating and they've kind of been affecting all age groups. Um, and we also know that the most severe strain, so the H3N2, was the, the most predominant strain. So this is, um, this is actually quite a, a difficult thing to, um, to uh, handle or do anything about because obviously this comes down to prediction and being able to predict whether, um, yeah, well, what is going to happen each season. So as I said, each season is unique. So the other thing is that the, um, so the, the, I guess this is what I'm trying to say is that we can't do much about the prediction side of things. It's, we've got to kind of go roll with the punches, as it were. Um, the things we can start doing things about, so low vaccine update, we can definitely kind of start to, to increase that. Um, we can definitely increase our, our testing and reporting as well, which is happening, which is good. So we're getting a better, clearer picture of the actual flu burden. Uh, and then finally as well, the decrease in vaccine effectiveness last season, so particularly due to the H3N2 strain and the ineffectiveness in the over 65s. Um, and this is where we'll, we'll talk a bit more about in, the, in, in a bit, is that there have been new vaccines introduced on the NIP, so there, there is a step, well, there's a step in the right direction anyway to try and, try and address this issue too. So influenza vaccines. Um, at the moment, what happens, and this is just to give you again a bit of a background knowledge on, on how these vaccines come about and, and how the development works. But basically, since 1999, there were, uh, it was recommended for annual immunisation. Um, and what the, the WHO are key in this, so the WHO play a key role. And we have a great centre in Melbourne that does a lot of this work. Um, and they, they basically look at selecting vaccines on the epidemiological data. And that means that throughout the year, all those swabs that get sent to the, the path labs, some of them will go down to Melbourne, they'll get typed and, and strained, and they'll figure out exactly what the circulating viruses are. Uh, and then they decide, they make a decision on what has to be included in the vaccine. And they do this twice a year. For us, it's around September time, they make that decision. Um, and what normally, I think this is, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I haven't actually put the right months in here. Oh, yeah, I have. Um, so, yeah, we, we normally get sort of a recommendation around September, and that normally means the WHO saying, we believe that in the next season, these viruses will be the circulating viruses, and they provide the manufacturers of the, the viruses, and then 
um, the, the manufacturers start scaling up the production. And this takes up to about six months. So we go from sort of September all the way through to sort of March, April time when the, the vaccines are actually produced. Uh, so you can see there's a big time delay. And when we think about exactly, you know, going back to the beginning of the talk when we talked about antigenic drift and the ability of the virus to change and mutate a bit, this is not a good thing either because what we can see sometimes is in that period, that six months, we can see slight changes to the circulating viruses. So by the time our vaccines are in, they might not be exact matches to what's circulating too. So it's a, it's a tricky process to do. It's very difficult, the WHO making those decisions as well on what is going to circulate. Um, and we can see this is again just a, an example. This is a horrible slide, I apologise. But if you look on this, this side here, each one of these lines represents a, a vaccine strain. And then this is a, across the last 28 years, so each column is a year. And, and the important thing is here, so well, firstly, we see that there's uh, over the last 28 years, we've seen about eight changes to the H1N1 strain, about 18 changes for the H3N2, and 14 for B. So, but the other important thing to note here is that you know, there's very few years that you can find where all three strains are the same as the previous year. So there's this continual need to change the strains of the virus as well. So this year, we've got recommendations, so there is a slight change. Um, there's a... Uh, a Singapore virus being uh, put in instead of the Hong Kong virus. A slight change to the H3N2, but the Michigan, Singapore and Bouquet viruses are in the trivalence. And then the additional one is the Brisbane one in the, the quadrivalent. So manufacturing, we kind of covered this, I'll skip through this pretty quickly, but basically it's an, it's an old process, it's about 80 years old. Um, a lot of chickens, a lot of eggs, it takes a lot of important steps as well. So as we said, those recommendations come in, the manufacturers start production, and then we finally get it released and put into through the regulatory authorities to release to, to people to put into arms. Um, when we look at what the vaccine does and how it works or what's in it and how it works, basically, as I've said before, so right at the beginning, we talked about that hemagglutinin, which is the key out of membrane protein for one of the key proteins for the virus and it binds to the host cells. That's kind of our primary antigen. That's the main thing we're looking at. And that's what we measure. So each vaccine is measured based on its hemagglutinin contents. The standard vaccine is about 15 micrograms per strain. I shouldn't say about. It's exactly 15 micrograms per strain. They're very strict about these things. Um, but we know there's other proteins present. We're not sure what. Manufacturers' processes differ slightly between different manufacturers. So there may be slight differences in different protein content, but we don't really know. No one's really investigated this and really looked into it and what it means. But basically, the, the hemagglutin is the key one here. When we look at the immune response to, in fact, the vaccines and infection, what we see is antibodies, or we believe antibodies are key immune effectors. They're produced by B cells. Um, essentially, natural infection and vaccines produce these quite strong antibody responses. So um, we know they play a role. Uh, the reason I say we think is because if you look in kids and older adults, when you look for kind of correlates of protection, they're called, so immunological markers of, yeah, we think that person is protected, they're very different. So we haven't really got a clear picture of what's happening immunologically. There's a lot of active research in this area too, um, and that ties in with our vaccine design as well. So, but we, yeah, ultimately, we think that the, the antibodies are the key, key kind of components. Um, T cells also have a really important role, so I have to admit I'm a T cell immunologist at heart, so I love T cells, so I'm a bit biased with T cells. Um, but yeah, these guys are really important too. As I said, the correlates of protection are really lacking for influenza. We have some, you know, some great examples when we look at meningococcal diseases um, and meningococcal vaccines, we actually can really clearly define what is protective and what's not. Um, we can do that through, there's you know, some great studies in the 60s that looked at this and you'll find that with meningococcal vaccines, there's you know, a teacher of over one in four you're protected, a teacher under is, is not protected. So we've got some really nice data that supports that. Um, and some special assays as well that work with that in line with that testing the functionality of the antibodies. Whereas when we look at influenza, all we know is that we think that you know, a teeter of one in 40 means you've got about a 50% chance of protection. But that's only if you're in the adult range of like 18 to 65. When we look over 65, it's different. And when we look under, it's different too. So ultimately what I'm trying to say is we're pretty bad at saying whether we're protected after we've had a vaccine based on um, measuring immune correlates. So how are antibodies working? Well, we think, again, we think <laughs> that the main mechanism is preventing the virus from infecting. So if you remember again, back at the beginning, we talked about that hemagglutinin and its ability to bind something called sialic acid on the cells, and that allows the uptake of the virus into the cell. So what our antibody is doing is basically preventing that interaction. So they're binding the hemagglutinin and stopping 
the, the influenza entering the cells. When we look at the efficacy, and I know vac influenza vaccines come under a lot of criticism um, for maybe not being as effective as they could be. And it's true, they're not perfect vaccines, I absolutely agree. Uh, and there's a point here I should make. So when we talk about efficacy, what I'm talking about here is randomized controlled trial data. And that means that um, when we do a, a, a proper randomized, double blind randomized controlled trial, and we look at the effectiveness or the efficacy of that vaccine in that population, um, we describe it as efficacy. And we think when these are meta-analyses, uh, we think the, the efficacy sits around 60% generally. Um, and that's, these studies have looked at multiple different trials that are not exactly identical and it's very hard to compare. So one of the important things to remember with influenza is when you start, as I, I keep saying, is that each season is unique and that means it's very difficult to kind of compare different seasons when we talk about vaccine effectiveness and efficacy. Um, when we look at effectiveness, so effectiveness I probably need to discern the two. Um, so efficacy, as I said, is, is derived from that clinical trial setting. So clinical trials are very, very controlled environments. You take a bunch of patients that have to fit a specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we know a lot about those patients. They're very controlled, very um, tightly monitored as well. And then we give one a placebo, one a standard vaccine, and, and one a, a, a tested vaccine sort of thing, and we compare the two and see how they compare. So in that, that's all great, and well, don't get me wrong, there's a reason that we do these, is because you know, regulatory bodies like the FDA, the TGA, all these guys need that kind of level of proof that your product works, and this is across the pharmaceutical industry, um, that we, we need this kind of this level of robust data, and it is very robust. However, what we find is that when these vaccines come into the real world, into a clinical setting, is we can see some differences because um, what we, you know, what may have been not included in your clinical trial is pretty much a lot of the percentage of patients you see, so multiple comorbidities and all these other additional things you have to factor in. So what we also do is we look at um, the, the effectiveness of the vaccine, and that essentially means how the vaccine works in the, the typical clinical setting, so what the vaccine looks like on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, this is some data from the CDC, so we know that on a good year when the, the vaccine matches the, the strains that are circulating, we see about 60%, so it aligns with our clinical trial stuff. On a bad year, we can go down to as low as 10%, um, and you could argue last year for the H3N2 was, was not good for the over 65s in particular, so it's in that ballpark. So just a reminder, I'm sure all of you guys are fully aware of this, but um, NIP currently allows for availability of vaccine for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, for six months to less than five years and then 15 years and over. Uh, and in other high risk groups, we see anyone who's six months and over that is um, potentially at risk of complications of influenza can access free vaccines, pregnant women, and also um, those over 65. And that's what we'll talk about in a little bit more detail as the new vaccines are available. Also, just to remind you, and I think this has changed a bit since I put this slide together, but um, there's a, a number of states now. So WA have actually been very uh, progressive in their approach for this. They've had an immunisation program for under fives for years, um, but with there's uh, sorry the the other states have now started to jump on board as of um, this season, I think. Okay, so new vaccines. So as we've talked about, and I've given quite a detailed discussion on on the. The last season and how it has been incredibly uh, challenging. We've seen high notifications, high burden of disease. Uh, and there has been a push to try and introduce a solution, particularly for those over 65s that are at higher risk of mortality. And as we discussed in quite a bit of detail, things like immunosenescence and severity of H3N2 and over 65s is, is a key problem here. So there's been two vaccines uh, introduced by the government and as of April, uh, so this year, so Fluzone High Dose, which is a Sanofi Pasteur product, and Fluab, which is a Securus product. Both vaccines are TIV, so that means trivalent, and they're only indicated for use in over 65s. So I need to make that very clear. So the program has started, and they are available on the NIP. Uh, and these vaccines will essentially replace what the standard QIV was given to the, the over 65s. So both these vaccines have been designed to, to essentially overcome the immunosenescence that we talked about. So as we said, one of the issues with the, the over 65s is this changing in immune system, which makes them less able to process and present antigen. Um, and so these, they're very different vaccines in how they work, but ultimately they've been designed to, to increase the immunogenicity of the vaccines in that population or in that cohort. 
So when we look at flu zone high dose, it's pretty much what it says on the tin is a high dose of antigen. So that means we've increased the antigen dose of uh, by four. So instead of having 15 micrograms of hemagglutin per strain, we have um, 60 per strain and 180 in total, remembering it's a TIV vaccine. So flu ads slightly different. What they've, uh, the approach there is that it, to use a standard antigen content, but enhance the immune system through the use of an adjuvant. Uh, and this is adjuvant called MF59. This is quite an old adjuvant, it's been used for a while. It's an oil and water emulsion adjuvant. It uses squalene, which is the oil, and some surfactants to make it soluble. So that basically uh, just means that the, the oil sits in the water nicely. Um, the trivalent formulation as well. So when we think about how these are working, so um, just trying to give you a bit of a different look at how, although they're trying to do the same thing, they work slightly differently. We've got to think about what a vaccine does when you put it in an arm. So ultimately what you're doing when you give that intramuscular injection is you're delivering antigen and then your immune cells start processing that antigen uh, and generate that immune response, that protective immunity. So the key here is that you've got antigen and immune cells. They're the two key components to generate this immune response. So as we've touched upon, uh, this is kind of, this is going back to the immunosenescence side of things. What we see in the over 65s is this, this decrease. And if you look at, don't worry too much about the complex details here. This is just describing that process of presenting the antigen to the immune system. But down the bottom here, we have two lines. The, the solid line is actually in a, a, a younger adult and the dotted line is in the older adult. And what we see is an inefficiency in this, this presentation. So we're trying to overcome this, this presentation to drive a new immune response. So what we see in a, in a healthy adult is that when we add a vaccine in, and um, this, is, this cartoon represents kind of what's happening from an immune perspective, is that the, our little diamonds here are antigen, our blue cells are our B cells, red cells, T cells, and our squiggly little cells here, the green ones, are our dendritic cells. So these little guys are the ones that are presenting the antigen to our B and T cells, which are going to provide us with immunity. And what we see in the healthy adder is the standard vaccines introduced and our immune system processes it presents and uh, we end up with vaccine specific immune cells so b cells producing antibodies and t cells as well uh, and then we have our effectors our antibodies and our cytokines in the adults the over 65s in, um, what we see is, is a slight, so there's a couple of things we see, we see a slight decrease in the number of immune cells that are available and we also see a decrease in the efficiency of how the immune system presents this antigen, the diamonds, into our B and T cells. And what that means is that we end up with less vaccine specific cells uh, and then a lower immune response. So in regards to how the two new vaccines work, basically what we see with high dose is that, as I said, there's an increased number of antigen there. So what we're doing is we're forcing the immune system to present that antigen. So we're increasing the efficiency of the, immuno, uh, the, the presentation of the antigen um, to the adaptive immune response. And as a result, we're increasing the number of vaccine-specific immune cells uh, and the immune response, finally, so the antibodies and cytokines. So for the adjuvanted vaccine, again, we're seeing a slightly different approach. So what happens here is that our um, adjuvant actually draws in more immune cells. So remembering that antigen and immune cells are key components to generate this immune response. If we've got more immune cells there, then we're going to drive a, a more vaccine-specific immune cells and a, an increased immune response too. So for flu zone high dose, I thought I'd give you a bit of background just on the clinical development. So where we've come from, um, essentially back in 1996, there were some studies done that looked at increasing the, the amount of hemagglutinin in populations over 65 and then measuring the antibody response. And basically what we found was that um, as we increase the dose, we increase the an uh, antibody response in these patients. Um, this led to essentially the, the uh, clinical development program, so we put it through phase one to three studies. Um, by 2009 it was registered in the US, it was registered with the FDA, uh, and the FDA at that point it was registered on immunogenicity only, and what that means is essentially we did a clinical trial, so we gave some people a standard dose vaccine, some people a high dose vaccine, over 65, took their blood, measured the antibody response, and said, hey look, the antibodies are increased, the immune systems responded better. Um, and the FDA said, yep, that's great, you can register it. However, we'd like your commitment for a, a, a true randomized controlled trial because we want to see whether your vaccine actually protects them against influenza. So that mean, means that we went ahead and we did a big post-license study and we looked at whether the vaccine actually stopped or prevented reportable influenza in the over 65s. Um, after that, we've done there's a couple of other studies that I'll, I'll mention and I'll go into a little bit more detail on, but after that, uh, it was registered in Canada in 2015 and then literally at the end of last year it was in 2017. 
um, in Australia. So when we look at levels of evidence as well, as I said, there's different levels of evidence. So um, we, when we consider our evidence, what we do as the, the randomized control trial is, is the key. That's what the regulatory, requ uh, regulatory requirements are. But as I said, that um, observational studies, so the, the, the effectiveness studies, and I didn't really clarify that earlier, what normally happens with those effectiveness studies is they're not randomized controlled, they're, they're observational studies. So that means that they depends, again, there's a big scale on different types of ob observational study design, but normally they're non-interventional uh, and they're observing what happens in a, a kind of a clinical population. So for flu zone, we know we've got a couple of large randomized controlled trials that have done and some also some large cohort studies that have also been done. Uh, so I'll give you a quick summary of those just to give you an idea of what the data is behind it. Um, so in regards to immunogenicity, as I said, so our first randomized control trial that got us registration, um, that was about 4,000 people. And then we went on to do that pivotal study, which was around determining whether the vaccine actually prevented lab-confirmed influenza. So in this case, we used 32,000 people. There's also been a, a nursing home study done by independent researchers that looked at about 53,000 people. And we've had some cohort studies done by, again, independently by the CDC and the FDA. So there's some pretty solid data, and you can see the numbers in here. Are, you know, for one of them was 2.5 million, and the other one was 6.1 million. So big numbers. They're observational studies, so they're observing what's happened in those populations. Hence the high numbers. You can't do that in a clinical trial. Um, it would be very expensive. Um, so this is just a, a, a touch upon the immunogenicity data. So essentially what we see on the left here, we've got the uh, high zone, it is high dose, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, I can't read it from there. High dose data. And then on the right there, we've got the flu zone. So that's a standard dose vaccine. And what we can see is these ratios here, which define the increase in the immune response. Um, so what we see is that there was statistics sorry, it's a mouthful, statistically significant difference between the high dose and the standard dose for all three strains. Um, and we can actually, so the FDA have allow you to call something superior if you achieve a level of 1.5 and above. Um, so we can say we have superiority achieved for H1N1 and H3N2. Now remembering H3N2 is the key one as well. Um, yeah, whereas B we saw a, not as high a, an increase. So in regards to the studies, I'll give you a quick touch on the studies, as I said, so the, after that registration with the FDA, we then went and did this big clinical trial, and essentially did 32,000 people. Um, it was across two seasons, so this is where it gets complicated. Again, remember I said every season is unique, so it's very hard to compare different seasons. But basically these were two H3N2 um, predominant seasons, so they were the, the main strain that affects, the, increases the severity of disease in the over 65s. Um, the people were randomized one to one, so they either received high dose or standard dose. Uh, and the study endpoints, the primary endpoint was to look at that laboratory confirmed influenza, so whether that actually the vaccines prevented laboratory confirmed influenza. We obviously monitored the safety too. Um, okay, so when we look at this, we're talking about relative efficacy here. So what that means is it just means how good was it versus the, the, the standard current, um, current standard of care, so that's our standard dose. So remembering that one, one group received the standard dose, the other group received the high dose. So the high dose we know gave, uh, and the primary endpoints as a lab-confirmed influenza, gives a 24% increase in effectiveness, or sorry, efficacy, um, compared to the standard dose. So we know across those two seasons as well from the CDC data that we think the vaccines were around 50% effective in those, those, that period. Um, what we also looked at, so after the study, and this is what's called a post hoc analysis, essentially that just means that once you've done your study, when you design your study, you, you <coughs> specify your endpoints that you look for, uh, and then you, you measure those endpoints, and then you obviously publish your results and your data. So what you can do after that is you can go back into the data and then look for any trends or anything that might stand out. And so we did that as well. And what we found is that um, we saw a reduction of about 40% in pneumonia events in the high dose group versus the standard dose group. Now, just be aware these error bars are quite big here. Um, but yeah, and then the serious cardiorespiratory events as well, we saw quite a significant decrease of about around 18, 19% too. From a safety perspective, we, um, from a, a severe adverse event, we actually saw no difference. In fact, it was a slightly higher number of severe adverse events in the standard dose group versus the high dose group. Um, but I should note that the local, obviously you will see in the high dose groups with um, slightly increase in local reactions, so uh, swelling, redness, a um, bit of myalgia, malaise, and a bit of fever as well, compared to the standard dose group. 
Uh, there's been independent research done as well. So we we had a, a randomised control cluster trial of 823 nursing homes. So it's about 53,000 people. Point is here that we um, so the the uh, again looked at standard dose versus high dose influenza vaccines in nursing homes. As we said before, this is a key issue in this in Australia as well. So it's becoming a really important issue. Uh, and this was unfortunately it was only done in one season, and it was an H1N1 season, not an H3N2. Um, and uh, they also showed quite significant protection. So they weren't looking at lab-confirmed influenza in this study. They were looking at uh, respiratory-related hospitalizations. So there's a decrease in that in about 13%. Uh, pneumonia hospitalization, about 20%. Um, so kind of, yeah, almost a sort of aligning with the, the clinical trial data too. Um, so as I said, we also had some big independent studies done too. Um, I'm sorry, I know we're running close to time, so I'll try and wrap up. Um, so these two independent studies are um, done by the CDC and the FDA, and what they looked at was uh, there was two and, a, two and a half million people in one, and this is pulling all the Medicare data from the US, and they looked at the probable influenza, so again, clinical outcome, not a laboratory confirmed outcome, uh, influenza hospitalization, and you can see the reductions here of about 22%, 22% for each of those in the high dose group versus the standard dose group, so again, relative efficacy. Uh, when we, they, they also did a huge study with 6 million people where they looked at influenza-related death. You obviously have to have a huge population to look at this because the numbers of influenza-related deaths, are, uh, you know, to study that, you need a large population. And they found about 24% reduction in influenza-related death compared to um, the standard dose group as well. So from an international perspective, um, uh, NACI, which is the national, uh, the, basically the target for Canada, have uh, recommended using high dose in the over 25s. No, oh, sorry, over 25, over 65s. I'm going to correct that very quickly. Only indicated for over 65s. Um, and then also the ACIP are also uh, acknowledging that these um, enhanced vaccines are, are more superior to. So in summary, basically, I've, I've, I know, so I've said this many times, I keep repeating myself, but every influenza season is unique. Uh, the 2017 was pretty much the worst on record and has led to a call for these new vaccines to be introduced. Um, and hopefully I'll convince you that you know, we have some data that shows that high dose is effective in this population. So hopefully it will, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, thank you. Okay, any questions? Thank you for that. Um, the science fascinates me, but it's useful to know that there might be increased rates of local mm. reactions so we can prepare our patients. Mm. But what about immune compromised patients? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, Immunocompromised patients, uh, it's, so I think what you've got to remember is that these vaccines have been designed for use in an immunosenescent environment. So that environment is very different to an immunocompromised environment. So when you consider what immunocompromisation actually means, you can have someone with very progressive HIV with very low CD4 T cell counts um, who's very, very immunosuppressed versus someone who might be taking low dose methotrexate for their psoriasis, who is also having some kind of immunosuppression. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that there's a whole gamut of different cohorts within immunosuppression. So to, to generate that kind of data and make a blanket sort of overall, yes, we think you, know, you can use that, um, is very difficult. There is some study data looking at various different situations and populations that is coming. It's taking, you know, it's in early stages to look at these kind of populations. But ultimately, there's no data that just says, yes, use it in immunosuppressed. So it is indicated for over 65s, and it should be used in over 65s at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. Yep. So how about patients, this is just before the flu vaccine came, mm. um, was just over 65, and asked to be whether they can buy a fourth quadrivalent instead of getting that one because they, they wanted to know if missing out on that fourth strain was um, a Yeah, look, all the vaccines in the PI, so the quadrivalents are still, I think the, most of them are aged from young till no end. There is no upper limit for the, the age indication for flu vaccines. Um, I, think, I think you've got to reframe that maybe because, again, think about what these vaccines have been designed to do. They've been designed to boost the immune response in the over 65s. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I think that's your first point is basically they've been designed to increase the immune response. So what we're trying to do as well is the focus should be on the H3N2 with the older population, with the um, over 65s. So that's the one that's really doing a lot of the severity of disease and uh, mortality. 
Um, but there's a couple of other things you can think about that, you know, firstly the bees, generally the bees are more prevalent in the younger age groups than the older age groups. Um, we do see a bit of cross reaction between the bees as well, so you can kind of reassure people in that regard too. So I think the question is, you know, if you give someone a QIV, um, are you really going to elicit a good immune response and is it really worth it versus having something which has been specifically designed to enhance the um, immune system? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I, I think we all will, but <laughs> um, yeah, I, look, I, I know what you're saying, and I think you're right. I, and I think, yeah, absolutely, you know, the point you're making as well is that that immunosenescence that we've spoken about and that change in the immune system doesn't happen overnight when you hit 65. That's a very gradual change, and what we see is more. It's more more prominent in sort of 75 and over and even older kind of things. So, um, yeah, look, there is the, the standard vaccine has been used in that population. For, it's, it's a clinical decision, ultimately. It's, it's what you guys recommend and what you think. Um, so you have two? Oh, I have two. I didn't realise that was what you were asking. Well, well, so. That was a secondary part. Okay. Then you have the so the simple answer is there's no data. We don't really understand what that looks like from a immunological perspective and a clinical perspective, whether that offers greater protection or not, we don't know. Um, it's a clinical decision, it's up to you guys, to be honest. Any other questions, guys? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.